that's it. Okay. Great. Thanks. Excellent. So I can share my screen again, can I? Yes. Yes, indeed. Oh, hello. Hey, Tara. Hey, Dennis. Where is that? All right. Okay. Here we go. Got it. Right. Well, thanks everybody for coming along. Um, <clears throat> I have a slight kind of weird announcement. So about uh, less than three hours ago, I was involved in a four car smash on the M50. So, um, I was a bit shaken up, but I don't think there's any major damage, so I thought I'd go ahead <laughs> anyway. But um, if this is not as coherent as it should be, then I can blame that. So, uh, yeah, so my my, uh, my van shunted into the back of somebody who'd abruptly stopped because he'd hit somebody else or something like that. Yeah. Right. So... Um, I'm going to try and kind of workshop this because um, I like to, I like to do a short as presentation as possible. Everybody okay? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then um, we can maybe uh, develop things in the Q and A. So you can probably regard these um, ideas as um, talking points for for later on. So I'll try and get all this done in twenty minutes or so. Um, although there are twenty slides, but. Um, a lot of them just uh, very quick. So cultural speciesism, because um, it's Dennis's new uh, phrase that uh, he likes so much. So we thought we'd talk about that. Then animal rights and um, associated ideas, one of which uh, are being vegan uh, values. So cultural speciesism is very important to me on the grounds that um, I'm a sociologist. And so I looked in my PhD at the support pillars of this, which, which are um, philosophy, theology, and everyday social practice. And so cultural species is a kind of interesting idea. And um, one of the places I get a lot of work from is this book here by David Nybert, or Nibert, uh, sometimes it's called. And it's called uh, Animal Rights, Human Rights, Entanglements of Oppression and Liberation, as it says on the screen there. And um, so he lays out how sociologists look at um, culture and why it's not the same as, say, psychologists. So he starts off by talking about Richard Ryder, who coined the phrase speciesism, uh, Peter Singer, who kind of popularized it, Tom Reagan, Kim Stallwood, who went vegan in 1976, a friend of mine from London, and then um, Marjorie Spiegel, who um, has got a controversial book called The Dreaded Com um, Comparison. He notes that they're all notable and uh, esteemed kind of um, academics, but he says that they present an individualistic and psychologically orientated um, view of oppression. And so he says that uh, essentially what sociologists do is see isms, not as embedded in the individual, but a wider part of being embedded into society. And so isms are ideologies, and that's described as a set of socially shared beliefs that legitimate an existing or desired social order. So, when we think about speciesism or racism or sexism, for example, we're not talking about a prejudice which is held by individuals as much as something which is embedded into the culture. And I think that one way of, one way of thinking about that perhaps is a little bit like if we were fishers and we were in the water, then our culture is all around us. In the same way as cultural speciesism, is all around us. Uh, you know, we can't escape from it. You watch a, a movie, you, you turn on the TV, you watch the news, listen to the radio, and you're going to find something which is, is speciesist in nature. One of the interesting things about, about this thing is the kind of easygoing nature of it, in the sense that it's just there all the time, but unquestioned. And that gives it its sociological strengths. 
in the sense that we don't have to think about it very much. It's, it's just kind of there. Um, a couple of examples I could give you from my own life is um, I used to be a project projectionist in Essex in England and a guy came over from South Africa and um, he was deeply racist as an individual, but he was just reflecting his culture. Um, I don't know whether you know, but the South Africans have got their own version of the N word and he just called people of color that word kind of automatically. You know, it, it was just part and parcel of the society in which we, we are born into and then socialized by. And, and the same would go in relation to, um, you know, to cultural speciesism. And another example, which kind of really only vegans kind of get really, is that I once heard on the radio that there was an aid worker who'd been imprisoned um, somewhere um, abroad, obviously, and then they were flying back and being interviewed, and they were saying how much that they were looking forward to um, eggs benedict when they got home. And from a vegan point of view, you're thinking, well, there you are, you know, you've suffered imprisonment, but you haven't connected the, the dots to the chickens and therefore the, the, the eggs that you're about to kind of consume. And then if we think about cultural speciesism in an economic sense, then we can think in terms of things like subsidies and the related idea that um, the power relations that go on, for example, the power of the farming lobby. Um, I mean, we know in places like Ireland and in England and places like France, the farming lobby are very powerful and politicians are often fairly scared of them and that they have to bring about policies which don't kind of upset the farmers too much because of, of, of that power. So the, these ideas are all kind of swimming around within the idea of, of cultural um, speciesism. So that was the first issue that we, we can use as an example of something to talk about, that uh, we don't think about it as embedded in an individual as much as in society or the social order, those kind of things. And I've just got something I've got to admit. There we go. Um, that's one thing there is that this is a kind of sociological um, technique, if you like, of sliding from the micro to the macro and back again. And so that's what sociologists tend to do all the time. If there's an individual issue like with an individual or say a family, we would then bring it out to the macro. So if you're talking about a situation involving a woman, we might bring it out to the notion of patriarchy and those kind of things. And the idea that um, things can be institutionalized is very powerful. So if you've got the notion that say the police, as it was said uh, in Britain once, that the police was institutionally racist, that's more than saying there's a few racist coppers. It's more than that. It's saying that the actual culture uh, is uh, racist and therefore that does then obviously as it were, feed in through socialization, peer groups, et cetera, into individuals. But the actual power, the base of this idea, the embeddedness is, is in the structure. Okay, so moving on then to um, another issue. Uh, if I can move this screen, let's see, oh, there we go. So we, we're moving towards the idea of um, the difference between rights and welfare, really. So. Um, what I've done here is I've picked out a few entries from a page on Wikipedia called um, the Timeline for Animal Rights and Animal Welfare. So obviously we've got to acknowledge that Wikipedia is not the best site, but it is heavily um, referenced this particular page. And so in that sense, it's not too bad, but there is always that caveat that, you know, when you're dealing with Wikipedia, it's not, not the greatest. Um, we start off then with, um, and what, what I've done is I picked out all the ones that seem relevant to the Sentient Rights Island and relevant to what happens when people regard other animals as sentient beings, that kind of thing. So uh, Enlightenment philosophers are here arguing that they were sentient beings who deserve um, protection. And the, modern, the first modern day laws were passed in Ireland and in Massachusetts. So um, this book here by an old colleague of mine, Piers Byrne, the first chapter is about this issue, you can see there, 1635, which is uh, an act against ploughing by the tail. So it used to be common in Ireland that they would attach a plough 
not by a kind of, um, you know, harness. They would just attach it to the tail. And one of the reasons for that was that if the, if the blade hit a rock, it was so painful for the horse or, or another other animal that was, that was tethered to stop. And so therefore it would protect the plow. Anyway, so that was one of, that's one of the first bits. That's not really that relevant to the sentencing. I just thought I'd um, throw that in, in the sense that it's interesting that one of the first acts of animal protection legislation was uh, enacted in, in Ireland. In fact, um, Irish individuals have been very kind of influential in terms of uh, the growth of laws, the starting up of, um, organizations, social movement organizations, that kind of thing uh, throughout history. But certainly in the kind of Victorian age when the anti-vivisection movements were getting into, involved, that, that kind of thing. The, uh, the one from 1687 uh, is interesting. The, there was a time when Japan banned the eating of meat and then it was uh, kind of repealed and then brought back again. And then the, the bottom one there is, um, Henry Salt. Now, Henry Salt is often regarded as the first animal rights theorist. Although it's interesting that he had a, an argument with Donald Watson from the Vegas Society, and he was he was arguing for the drinking of cow milk, which is an interesting one from an animal rights point of view. But, he, but he's often credited as being the first animal rights scholar. And so in that sense, it would make Tom Reagan uh, the most famous one, if you like, but the second wave, if you like. Now this top one is interesting, Universal Kinship, uh, 1906. So this is um, J. Howard Moore. And again, we're talking about um, ethical consideration and treatment for all um, sentient beings. Uh, it's based on Darwinian ideas, which, which Reagan talked about, the golden rule. And then this idea of um, sentiocentrism. So that ethical view there that places sentient individuals at the center of moral concerns. Now, this is interesting from an animal rights theory point of view in the sense that when Reagan comes along in the 80s, he doesn't, he doesn't go for this radical idea. He goes for a more conservative idea, which is called subject of a life. So we, we might get to talk about that. Um, there it is. I can just show you that one. I'll probably stop showing you these. I know it's a bit irritating when people do this. Can I ask you a question before we go on? Yeah. Okay, I was just curious about the one about Massachusetts uh, Bay Colony. The, that yeah. was in your side. Well, I just, just can you just tell us what that was? Uh, it was just, uh, um, it it was interesting because it was a, a time when they were they were um, enacting rights for humans, mm -hmm. uh, but when they came to consider the uh, other animals involved, then it took, got translated to welfare. And, and this, is, as, as you'll see, as, you, as you'll see with, with all of this, and this is a, a challenge for Sentient Rights Island, I believe, is the fact that um, when sentiency of other animals are concerned, it's automatically translated into animal welfare concerns. And we'll see this time and time and time again. And obviously that's because the culture, again, understands animal welfare and it's not good at understanding animal rights as a theoretical position. And so there's always this potential to slide into welfare when you're dealing with other animals. And so we've, we've had it in recent years, a whole series of declarations that other animals are sentient. And they immediately then think of, well, that means that we should be careful about their welfare. Whereas really, if a being is sentient, that implies that that being has rights. And if they have rights, protective rights, moral rights, which would then be codified into law, legal rights, then that would mean the abolition of the use in question. So we'll, we'll see this tension all the time when, when we're going through all of these things, that when it comes to humans, then bad things happening to them will be abolished because they're rights bearers. When it comes to non-humans, <laughs> the idea is that, uh, yeah, okay, we can see them as sentient beings, but that doesn't automatically mean that they're rights bearers. It means that we should be careful about their welfare. That, that, that's, that's, what, that's what goes on. So we've got uh, animal machines, which kind of really kind of focused on industrial farming or factory farming. And the, the animal movement have been focused on that um, ever since. And you can, you can see this issue that I've been 
highlighting in the sense that there was an outcry following the publication in 64. And so the British Parliament formed the Bramble Committee, which, which was the first one to kind of look into issues of welfare, sentiency, pain, suffering, and all the rest of it. And they concluded that uh, they came down on the idea of the five freedoms, which, which, which are just wel welfare me measures. Okay. So once again, the, the, fa the fact that you've got someone exposing animal use in this scenario is not going to translate to animal rights. It's always going to translate to animal welfare. And as I understand it, Sentient Rights Island want to do something about that and to try to bolster the idea that, that sentiency in other animals implies rights, which implies abolition of their use. Whereas at the moment, everything gets translated into welfare. I was, I was talking to Dennis about this a few days ago, and that's going to be a real issue for Sentient Rights Island um, ongoing. Not least because that's also the way that the animal protection movement, the so-called animal rights movement, also thinks. They will often slide things into welfare as well as, say, politicians will. So farmers will do it all the time. Oh, well, we look after animals. We, we love them and all the rest of it. And circus proprietors will do that. Even vivisectors will do that. Politicians will do that. And large parts of the animal rights movement will do that as well. So it all, it all slides into welfare. And if uh, Sentient Rights Island is going to stand against that, then it's going to be quite a challenge, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, 1975, the publication of Animal Liberation. Uh, that's Peter Singer's book. And that's not an animal rights book, but it, it was seen as a kickstart for what's now called the animal rights movement. Uh, a year later, the Animal Liberation Front was, was formed, 1976. And then we get rights based animal rights. And th this is uh, the case for animal rights uh, by Tom Reagan. And this is, um, it's quite a thick book, 400 pages. And it's quite a dense, uh, closely reasoned um, argument. Going back to what I said about in relation to, to the thing about didn't go for sentiency, went for subject of a life. Um, when Reagan was writing, I mean, started off in the late 70s, and this was published in 1983, he, he tried to put things quite conservatively. For example, when he talks about subject of a life, which, are, which is the criteria for being a rights bearer, he, he talked about mammals of one year and older, and then there was there was a, um, a kind of argument about which individuals, you know, are we talking about mammals? Are we talking about fishes? Are we talking about birds uh, and this kind of thing? So he was drawing things quite conservatively. And one of the reasons for that is I think he wanted to move the argument on and not just get it bogged down um, in the fundamentals at, at the beginning. And so I think, he, I think he drew things quite conservative compared with other people. And what people like um, Singer did and Ryder is they went for sentiency rather than subject to a life, which, which is seen as, as a bit more powerful uh, in a way. And then when you get to the 90s here, Animal Property and the Law, that's a very important book uh, for Sentient Rights Island. That's Gary Francione, his, his first book. So he looks at the property status of other animals and how that is a problem um, for, for, for them in the sense that if their items are property and they're up against, as it were, in court, for example, the, the property owner, there's a complete power imbalance. Then Rain Without Thunder, uh, this is 96, that really he's, he starts to complain now about the fact that the animal welfare movement is really an animal, uh, the other way around, the animal rights movement is really an animal welfare movement. And that is um, dragging back the idea of putting together a rights-based position. So. Reagan tried it in the 80s. It kind of worked for a couple of years, especially in the States. Never really took on um, in Britain or, or elsewhere, but in the States it did for a while and kind of culminated in 1990 when there was a march for animals at Washington. And the highest estimate is about 90,000 people at, at that march. And so it, it was a big do at the time, but then um, everything started to crumble. Um, in terms of animal rights and it all kind of faded away into animal welfare as it normally does and that's kind of my kind of suggestion that it's going to happen all the time so you're going to have to be careful about that so this is uh, picking out those things with regard to 
uh, sentient beings. Uh, starts off in um, 97. Um, I think, uh, ironically, Compassionable Farming had a big deal with this, I think, um, obviously a welfare group. And again, sentient beings, not just merely property. And again, and I think that Dennis can speak to this probably even more than I can, is that when it was translated into law... Oh, I, I can't get it anyway. I don't know. Sorry, Dennis. Um, okay, should I carry on? <laughs> When it was yeah. translated, when it translated into law, it it, it became um, an issue an issue again of, of yeah. welfare, and they they brought in the idea of cultural. Well, is it what you sit there if I get up? Do you want me to get it? Hey, Bernie, why don't you mic mute, mute your mic, Bernie? <laughs> and then we got we got a lot of things going on in two thousand and twenty one, uh, and it's all related to to sentient beings. And I, I think in terms of uh, this group, the, you're all completely up to speed um, mm -hmm. with, with all of that. Then the, the final one is the, um, the idea that uh, other animals are recognized as interested persons. This is to do with, um, what's his name? Um, Pablo Escobar, and something to do with um, hippopotamuses <coughs> who were threatened with being killed. And so, they were, I think, in Colombia, where they already had legal standing. And then there was something to do with the North American courts. And they had to establish that other animals could be interested persons in law. OK, so I, I'm not I'm not great on on legal uh, rights. You need somebody like uh, Steve Wise um, for that. Yeah. Um, I don't know what you're saying. The that case one. for animal rights is based on moral rights. Yeah, so, you know, Reagan would... Take it here. Right. And the, okay. the difference so there is that the, the, the idea of moral rights, you know, the animals have them already. You all right there, Bernie? Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Sorry, touch it. <laughs> okay, let's, let's move on. Hi, Bernie. Okay, so... Um, oh, mute I just me, got no. slides from Tom Reagan here. Um, mute. Stop video. Share oh, so some record he's, reactions. No. He's talking really, this is kind of really okay. one of his planks. It must be here. It must subject, be. subject of a life, yeah? I Other animals are in the world. Yeah. They're aware of the world. Yeah. They're aware what happens to them and what happens to them matters to them. This was, this was a slogan that Reagan said over and over again. Uh, it's, it's quite a powerful one. And then the last one on this one, would be um, that Reagan was born, this, this is from 1983, the, the case, that to be, to be for other animals doesn't mean that you're against humanity. And um, this uh, little thing at the bottom, the animal rights movement is part of, not opposed to the human rights movement. Uh, we at VIP, we've got a, um, a, a big banner that, that says that. Okay, how are we doing for time? Okay, please. Yeah, not too bad, I suppose. Roger. Okay, so um, let's just have a look at some vegan values, as, I, as I've called it. And um, really, okay, the, so vegan, the Vegan Society, oh, or the Vegan Social Movement, was formed in 1944. Now, that, that's a controversial yeah, thing, <laughs> in the sense that um, a lot of people oh, um, are suggesting that there were vegans before the Vegan Society, and that there might have even been people who came together in an organized oh, way okay, to campaign for things like veganism or what became called veganism. But when I do talks, I always point out that I'm talking about the people who came together in a, in a kind of collective way to form the, the vegan social movement. And that took place uh, in 1944. And as you can see there, in terms of the... Um, Sorry, Roger, would you mind muting everybody so we can hear you properly? Yes, sir. you have control of the screen, Roger. Well, let me see if I can go down there. Oh, yeah, I can. Okay. Okay. There's two burners. Uh, <laughs> right, I think that might. God, one's bad enough. I need you can. I think I think I think that that might do. I think most of it was coming from burning. I think so. Um, uh, me myself, mate. So, 1944. Obviously, we talk about the last years of the Second World War, and um, in the end, the vegans were 
were trying to work out why humanity had become so violent. They just had two global conflicts in fairly rapid succession. And they, they thought that something had happened to humanity that put them into a new form of barbarity, which might seem a bit um, hyperbolic, perhaps. But I think that it's, you've got to remember, these are the people who are learning about the concentration camps um, kind of fresh off the page, as it were, and fresh over the, over the radio. And I think it must have been quite a shock to their system. I mean, we look upon it as a kind of historical thing now, but in terms of them, it really was um, something that they were learning for the first time. And so the, the actual horror of uh, the Holocaust really, really struck them. And, and they set about um, trying to work out what to do. First of all, they declared peace. They saw veganism as part of the peace movement. And then um, they thought that veganism was about, about issues like justice, nonviolence, and I tend to sum it up there with the with the bit that veganism was like a justice for all uh, movement because they 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 talked about injustice in in a general sense. So the focus and scope, the focus of veganism has, has always been about human relationships with other animals, but the scope has always been wider. And they talked about the benefit that 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 humans would get from uh, bringing about a vegan world. Not least this bit that I've pulled out in, in large print, they believe that veganism was part and parcel of the moral evolution of humanity. And that we would then start to climb back out of this, this pit of despair or whatever. Some of, the, some of their language, as, as, as we'll see, is, is a bit dramatic. And in terms of language, they are a product of their time. So they do say man rather than humanity, that kind of thing. So there is, there is that kind of uh, issue about the way that they speak. Okay, um, the vegan movement was, uh, you know, the, the, if, you, if you look back at the history of the movement, uh, it can seem very male dominated, but there's a lot of very powerful women involved at the start of the vegan social movement. Elsie Shrigley, sometimes called Sally Shrigley. You've got uh, Dot Watson, who used to be called Dorothy Morgan, and obviously married uh, Donald Watson. Uh, Kathleen Janaway and Eva Batt. Um, I've included this one because I thought you might like to, to see, uh, this is Kathleen Janaway, and she's formed a group called Movement for Compassionate Living. But it says here is really quite interesting. Change will only come when we get the masses of people changing. The politicians will go on until they are frightened of losing the votes. And the industrialists will be the same. So I thought, given, given the fact that you're probably going to be in line to talk to TV, uh, TDs eventually. I thought that would be an interesting thing because people tend to see politicians as leaders, whereas really they're followers. They follow the money and they follow the votes, which essentially is what Kathleen Janaway uh, is saying uh, there in that. And then these are just uh, summaries, just to, just to end, just to give us a couple more um, uh, talking points, if you like. This is uh, Kath Clements, who um, did a summary of veganism uh, and it says 1995 there, but the actual first edition of this book came out in, in 1985. So veganism is about having a consistent approach to human rights and animal rights, ecology and world food problems. In terms of the modern vegan social movement, and I'm sure that many of you will know this, this is not a popular stance. A lot of people want veganism to mean it's about other animals only. Whereas the people who started our movement didn't think of it uh, that way uh, at all. And you can see that over and over again in what they say. This, this one, for example, this is 64 by now. Eva, Eva Bat was an officer of the Vegan Society and she wrote a couple of best-selling vegan cookery books. But she also wrote a pamphlet and she said, uh, veganism is one thing and one thing over, uh, only a way of living which avoids exploitation, whether it be of our fellow men, again, the second language of the time, the animal population or the soil upon which we rely for our very existence. I always tend to comment, it's interesting that they thought that the soil could be exploited, but really they, they meant depleted by this, I think. There's a famous book from the 80s by John Robbins called um, Diet for a New America. And he talks about the fact that our topsoil um, situation is almost like a, a crisis situation at the moment. Now, this is the year after the formation of the vegan social movement, and this is the best known co-founder of the vegan movement, Donald Watson. The object of the vegan society is to oppose 
the exploitation of sentient life. Personally, I tend to think that this is a better definition of veganism than the actual current official definition, which started about 1979. And by the time we got to 1988, it was in place. That's the one that talks about practicable and possible, those kind of things. But I just like this because it's nice and succinct and it just kind of gets to the point, really. OK, uh, I'm not going to read these, these out, but um, I'm just going to pick out a couple of uh, issues from it. Th this one here is Watson claims that if vegan values came about, it would represent the greatest peaceful revolution ever known to humanity. And again, this kind of interlinking of issues in the better interest of men and animals alike. You you'll see this, I'm coming to the end now, you'll see this um, being kind of rehearsed over and over again, this same kind of point. This one here, this is Jack Sanderson talking in 65 about Donald Watson. And he says, erase from the face of the earth all the wrong exploitation of the collective life on earth, that of the creatures and the plants and that of man. So again, all this kind of interlinking of ideas. This is Leslie Cross, who probably could be credited for bringing about the evolution of vegan philosophy. Um, he started writing about 1949 um, and he finished about 1955. And so he, 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 kind of, he kind of talks about what veganism means. He, talk, he talks about the obvious, the obvious changes that veganism would bring. No butcher's shops. The milkman, milkman, of course, in those days, if he still goes on his ride, uh, will be delivering vegan milk. And so that's, that's quite an interesting thing to be thinking about in the 1950s. The countryside will not be heavy with the anguish of cows crying for the calves, which is a very modern sounding kind of claim from vegans. There will be no slaughterhouses, no vivisection laboratories, and no one will hunt, uh, hunt animals for fun. And then he says um, some of the changes are, are not so obvious. And those, again, are the ones which are knock-on benefit for humanity. So they essentially had the position that animal liberation was our liberation, that if we emancipate other animals, we will get huge benefits, not least going back to that idea that in moral terms, we would evolve back into much more kind of moral beings. In, in a vegan world, as they saw it, we would be much less violent, uh, if not best of all non-violent but we would much less violence as, as an entire species that's how they saw it um this is where cross is saying this is 51 that veganism is not so much welfare as liberation for the creatures and the mind and heart of humanity so again those kind of all those kind of issues are kind of coming back over and over again and then um because he would free himself from many of the demands made from his lower nature. So that's a real kind of product of its time. You probably, we wouldn't talk about lower nature of humanity nowadays so much, but the benefit to man himself would be incalculable. And so this is the benefit of a vegan world to humanity. So those kind of ideas. And this is the final one, which is, um, this is a, a sociologist, um, a sociologist friend. And this, this guy actually is one of a team who are looking at the Donald Watson ar archive. They, they've had permission to look at Donald Watson's papers and everything. And he's called Matthew Cole. And in 2014, he wrote a chapter in this, in this book about critical animal studies. And he says, the vegan aim or the object of veganism combines passionate non-exploitation of other animals with an emancipated vegan self and a more compassionate human society. Vegan ethics from the beginning was directed towards these interconnected goals of transforming human beings and transforming human society, with both flowing from the foundational reconfiguration of human, non-human animal relations. Sorry if that's a bit wordy, but uh, Matthew is a sociologist, so we, we, we often do that uh, as sociologists. So, so, that, so that's that. Um, I, som I sometimes start to answer my own questions, but. We'll, we'll leave that from here. I think I'll, I'll stop sharing and we can maybe have a talk about, about these issues. There we go. Can I ask a question? Yes, indeed, of course. That, okay. That's what it's all uh, about. <laughs> okay. um, now, now, what I was thinking about, and I'm not quite sure how it all fits in, but the whole idea of, of, of 
you know, of animal liberation and, and the same thing for people is that seems particularly current in terms of like the whole thing with the virus, the whole, the whole pandemic about how probably they all started in the Chinese meat markets or some places like that where, you know, animals are treated horribly and then it transfers the, the virus goes, switches to people. Um, but I've read, you know, several articles, mostly in The Guardian, about, like, if people figure that out, and we started to, like, not do terrible things, like boil animals to death, um, and that it would be our self-preservation. So it's mm. not, it's like, it's not just like a, it's like a quid pro quo almost, um, that, uh, yeah, we would be better, we would not be doing horrible things to animals, but on the other hand, we wouldn't be creating our own destruction either. Um, it, it's sort of hard to get that across to people. Yeah, but uh, essentially that's what the pioneers of the movement talked about, that our liberation or their liberation was our liberation. And that's, yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah. what you're saying. I mean, we are, we are talking about a zoonotic disease when we're thinking about the pandemic. And there's been a whole series of them. That there are predictions to have worse to come. And yeah. it, mainly it's because we keep messing with, with other animals. And right, exactly and all of that yeah. yeah that's right and so we're, we're obviously i mean there are a few there are a few theories about how covid19 came into being but mm -hmm. the scientific consensus seems to be that it was a zoonotic disease yeah, it and it seems to be the wet markets of of yeah. china yeah. and yeah. all that and then it, it quickly moved into things like um mink farming especially yeah. in germany and that's well, a situation where it was transferring backwards and forwards from humans to other animals, yeah, mutating yeah. As, it, as it did. And now, of course, we've got all these variants. And again, you know, we, we, I, I mean, I agree with you. We're not learning our lesson. But if no, we're not. We're not. We fill ourselves in, yeah. Well, how, I mean, I'm just curious, do you have any ideas, suggestions on how to get that across to people? I mean, it's, it's sort of like there's this whole denial. Like today, like in, in you know, in Boston, people are just taking their masks off. Everything's dandy. Everything is not dandy. Um, you know, it's it's not at all. So, if, I always go back to what someone told me once: the denial is the least effective defense mechanism. And it's true. But what? Well, well, how do you get around? I mean, how do you get around that? Well, it's it's very difficult because I mean, obviously, this is a very big question. Tom Reagan would say that's a very difficult question because because yeah, it, you know, and um, I mean we. We are talking about really we're looking at the conservatism uh, of humanity now and what, one, one of the things that we know as sociologists that we're most conservative about is our diet. It's one of the things that we, you know, e each culture tends to have, you know, a few foods. I mean, there's thousands and thousands of edible plants and yet there's a few foods that each, you know, so we, we're, we're, we're deeply conservative when it comes to food and we're deeply conservative to things like change you know and so that's one of the main problems that you know people don't want to change and one of the main narratives of the entire pandemic is that people right from the start wanted to get back to normal right right yeah. right but no, but normal is violent so we it, don't it, want to get it, back it to normal. we want to get back to better than normal yeah we do some of us do yeah mm. yeah mm. Okay, don't. Actually, how to do it, Louise? I don't know. <laughs> well, I know, I know. I don't either. But it's like it's really frustrating because it's like it just seems like because it's like it's so stupid. Um, I mean, it's just like we're just doing the same thing over and over and over. You know, like, it's the same thing with you know that we're making all of these terrible weapons and and you know, some of the Raytheon people like that are making a zillion dollars off the war in Ukraine, but. So there it goes. That's what we're doing. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. But again, you know, um, you know, we're part. We're in a way, we're part of the peace movement. But um, I mean, it's often being said, isn't it, that if worldwide the uh, the arms trade stopped for a couple of days, we could yeah. feed everybody. You we know, and like we talk, we're talking about huge amounts of of, of money and resources. Oh. I mean, just think of the environmental damage that has we're been. Awful. 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 And Yemen, let's not forget. Yeah, Yemen, of course, we've got the more controversial Israeli-Palestinian issue as that well. That one too, yes, yeah, 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 yuck. Maybe we ought to go around the panel and say, how do, how do we solve this massive cultural and political problem? 
And what would the prize be? <laughs> well, mm -hmm. <laughs> right, um, Dennis, you've got your hand up, I believe. And you're muted. Is that my fault? I'm on, I'm on music now. Yeah. Okay, just thinking about what you were saying, Roger, and thank you very much for the talk this evening. It was excellent. I really enjoyed it. Now, I had two conversations with two people today, and the one thing they both said to me, which was I found pretty, pretty profound, I reckon we're talking about the Irish context here now, that we have momentum. And I was trying to work out what, you know, in the conversations, how did they come about that? And then I was in, 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 when, in when you were speaking, it was coming to me because you talked first about welfare and then you talked about animal rights. And then we went into vegan. So uh, with that march in New York in the 90,000s, that was the height of, 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 of uh, animal rights, we'll say. But what has happened since, and we know this in the Irish context, is the amount of people who have gone vegan. Now we can talk whether it's ethical vegan or plant-based or what have you. But in 2018, Board Bia assessed the population of Ireland as, as being 4.3% uh, of the whole population as being vegan in some way or other or vegetarian. Yeah, it, was high. it was quite high relative, wasn't it? Yes. Yes. So I, I think if we put animal rights and the quest for animal rights and the vegan population together, I think that is the momentum. There is The, the people are there. They're in the population centres, Dublin, Cork, um, Galway. They're there. I mean, we look around, um, if, go back five years ago, if I was to go to Dunn's or any of the big supermarkets, there wasn't a range of vegan products. So uh, an apple is vegan, we all know that, and a banana, that sort of thing. But the amount of products that is in there now, uh, far vegan to buy in all the supermarkets, tells me somebody is buying those. I mean, Dunn's stores are stocking in Javita. One time, the only place you could get that in Galway, was uh, Evergreen, then Holland and Barris started it, and now Dunn's have it, and other, so other places have it. I've even seen it in Aldi. So th there is a populism coming, and I'm not sure where I got this figure from, but 3.5% of the population is enough to bring around a change in society. This is my point. And if we're, if in, in 2018, if we were at 4.3, because it has to have gone up since, I think this is momentum, and I think we have a chance to make a difference now. It's not just um, in the short term and get some welfare gains. I think we can make some inroads in rights. And personally, from where we're coming from, uh, we have two years at least to the next election. We have loads of time to get organized and put in a good fight and put a, make a good case and get all those new words that we've got from you, like cultural speciesism, get all those into the conversation, the national dialogue on the airwaves, TV, in the print media, on social media, and get people using those words as opposed to us banging on every day about cruelty and cruelty and this and this is awful and that's awful. And I think of the other thing that you were saying about in the, um, the, the vegans were talking about the soil and all that. We have this now with climate, that we have a third reason. And as yourself and Louise were talking, health as well, there are so many pillars now to build all this on, and plus the, the increase in the vegan population. I think there is definitely a chance that we could have uh, a, an amount of success that would be tangible. That's how I feel at the moment. Mm. Well, and, and it is global too. I mean, it definitely is. No, it's in Ireland, but it's also everywhere. Yeah, it's and it's, it's all over. Um, and it's, it's, you know, I, th I believe that the. The vegan movement has at least an element of compassion in each mm -hmm. person that has gone vegan, whether it be compassion for their own individual health or or their their family's health or their or animals or sentient beings or the planet. You know, there's a huge, huge amount of people that will um, think about compassion when they think about veganism. Yeah. And I think for, for, you know, I think we need to start throwing some compassion to the farmers, to the people that do exploit um, animals 
um, and have been brought up to to accept that as something that's normal, you know, and in 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 their own lives, they're they're broken beings, they're they're you know they're masking, they're they're going through pressure from departments of agriculture to produce and to 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 create more produce um, in, in, in forms of animals and stuff. And I think the suicide rate in farmers, as well as doctors, as well as vets, um, is, is, is just humongous. You know, it's it's way out there. And, you know, I've, sp I've spoken to a lot of farmers in my life. I've grown up in the country and blah -de da um, You know, I've, I've done activism outside meat factories and, and blah -de da And um, I've always asked them, what was the first animal and what was the first memory that they ever had? And you would see their faces light up. And it was just, it was beautiful. You know, and they'd tell me about the puppy or the kitten or the hen or, you know, and then I'd, I'd ask them what their last memory was and their faces would just drop, mm. you know. Um, so I think there's a huge outreach needed to be done to, to help farmers um, transition, <laughs> you know, in, into growth and stuff. Mm. Yeah, well, obviously, one thing we know about farmers is that they're heavily subsidised. And so if we were to learn about the subsidy system, that would go a long way to be able to think about that transition uh, idea, because, th because that's very important, because um, I've had conversations with, with farmers on the street. And when you say, well, you know, what vegans were hoping to do is, you know, transform you into plant farmers. And then quite often they will listen to you. Going back to Dennis and the points you made, um, no. on those, well, first of all, uh, momentum, the, the real issue about momentum is whether you can sustain it or not. Um, so that's one thing. And then in terms of those numbers, that they're, they're contested those in the sense that um, it's often said that if you've got people with an unshakable belief and they go to, to a, a say, for example, that vegan animal rights is a thing, kind of thing, as it were. Um, but the the numbers are contested. So some people say 10%, other people say 20, 25. So I would say that the 3.5 that you mentioned, Dennis, is quite low in, in that general discourse. But um, I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, I hope it's right, but I don't know whether uh, most people would agree with that low number, you know? Okay. Thank you, Roger. Yeah, no, loads of great points there um, from everybody. Uh, Carol, were you saying something? Um, Maria Fahi, who isn't on tonight, um, she had a very good idea. Um, her idea, Dennis, I think um, if we can actually get around to doing this, is to educate children with leaflets at schools, pick um, a few towns and schools and get started that way either with the juniors or the transition years um and education i think is the way to go mm. education, education 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 it's it's very important uh, but bernie and i um have a group called um what's it called bernie i can never remember it An animal education outreach um it's getting access to schools which are the problem there and all the groups, even, even the established ones who have done school outreach for years and years, like Animal Aid in, in Britain, for example, they have difficulty. I remember talking to Animal Aid a few years ago when I was part of Vegan Island, and they were saying, well, really, the issue is access. And then you've got the issue of you've got to have age appropriate materials, those kind of things. But, but access is a big one because they're kind of in... Um, in place of, of the parent, you know, um, what's it called? Parental, I can't remember the name of yeah, it now. Parental it's, consent. Yeah, that's it, yeah. And so so they they have to be very careful that they're not gonna do anything that's gonna upset their, right. their own things. And especially if they've, I mean, Animal Aid said that they've they've had situations where the kids have run back to their, their parents and said, right, I'm a vegan now. 
Oh, and then the, the, par <laughs> the parents go back to the school and complain. What? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I just say one little thing. Okay. Yeah, um, no, I, I was just thinking about um, that sometimes it seems as though like just even one product is in, in introducing that to people. Like oat milk is really taking off over here. Um, so you, you sort of work it with something that actually people discover they like. Um, and that they like it because it's, especially, it tastes good. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it, it doesn't hurt cows. Um, but it just seems like just an inroad with something like that uh, is ammunition. Uh, mm -hmm. works. I'd love um, uh, someone to develop, you know, say, uh, you know how everything is so visual at the moment, you know, children are so, you know, stuck in their screens and stuff. Um, I'd love someone to develop a DVD that would be family friendly, that could be watched and accessed, you know, accessed through so many different avenues, cheaply, just explaining, you know, the, the land and the change of land and um, through farming and you know people well so many so, there's so many things that could be put on a you know a half hour dvd that you you get in for a fiver and in, in a in a store you know um if someone would uh, jump on that would be great <laughs> do people, you know? people still buy dvds i, I don't know well <laughs> or, or something to download you know, there. Oh, yeah. fine. But you you talked about that in that loan, um, Tara. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I remember I sent, um, I was traveling to hospital one day and I decided that Noel Fitzpatrick was going to um, be the receiver of my email. And I had, I had like three hours to travel. So it was quite a lengthy email making suggestions on on well, how um, you know Ireland could uh, do with his, um, his influence in, in um, helping animals and helping people understand about the land and how farmers are exploited also by by the departments. You know, the, you were chatting there, Roger, about you know, farmers getting subsidies, it'd be fantastic if, um, you know, we could start programmes heading towards subsidies that will allow farmers to um, grow crops on their individual terrains, yeah. you know. Uh, and, and so the new technology, things like vertical farming, we need, we need to know more about that kind of thing. Because yeah. farmers will often say that their land is too... Um, too poor to, to, yeah. to grow anything, uh, yeah. which is actually not, not true in the sense that um, Movement for, for Compassionate Living said it years and years ago that um, nut trees, for example, will grow anywhere, you know, hemp, mm -hmm. hemp as well. And in fact, mm -hmm. um, if you Google it, if you d do a kind of Google images thing, you yeah. can see trees growing out of rocks. You know, you've got, oh. you've got a kind of little abandoned kind of island somewhere. And you've, you've got a little kind of forest on it because they've been left alone. And so trees will are very tenacious, you know, so trees will grow anywhere. But, but the new technology of vertical farming, I think, is very interesting in the sense that um, one issue that vegans need to at least address or at least think about is the issue of crop deaths. Um, and so that would eliminate uh, those and um, it, I, it seems to me that that could be the future, certainly from a vegan point of view. And, and vertical farming, I'm, I'm not aware of it. Well, it's just a way of kind of, you know, it's a totally controlled situation where, you, you, you know, you, you might, it's kind of like a, a farm inside a building, which is totally controlled by, by things like lights and computers and stuff. But, that, but you can also do, do that small scale. I have the, there's a lot of these... Um, containers that you put on the backs of ships that, that you've got a, a little farm inside. And they've even experimented on having a vegetable farm, which is attached to a restaurant. And so it's kind of growing up the, the wall on, on a restaurant, as it, as it were. And so when you order your food, the chef goes out and 
harvests the vegetables and goes and cooks them. <laughs> which, which, is a, which is a real good thing. Go, going back to DVDs, there, there is one, it doesn't really fit all the criteria that you mentioned, but there is one called Stimulus Response. And that's quite interesting. I think it might still be on YouTube. And um, that talks about uh, the capacities of other animals and talks about how oh, it really kind of establishes that they're sentient uh, beings, but also problem solvers, that kind of stuff. And so it's, it's based on animal ex experiments, but not the invasive ones. It's, it's kind of observation of other animals, that, that kind of thing. You know, like uh, how, how, does, how does a chicken work their way through a um, obstacle course, that, that kind of thing, you know. Okay, I'll have a look at that. Great. Does anybody remember um, something on YouTube that spoke? Um, it was English based and they spoke about um, the fact that with with sheep farming and, cow, uh, you know, um, cow farming, et cetera, et cetera, throughout the years, you know, how, how nature has has changed so much due to all of that. Does anyone, um, has anyone seen um, a movie like that? Not a movie, a documentary. No, I must look up, I'll find it, I'll, I'll let you know. I, th I think there's quite a lot of stuff about, about the kind of agricultural revolution, if that's what you're talking about. Mm. Mm. It was one in particular in England. I'll, I'll find it. Yeah. Okay. Quinoa is uh, taken off in England. Um, sorry, I've unmuted um, myself. You're, you're muted, Bernie. Mm, no, it's me. Sorry. I can hear. You. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, quinoa is taken off in okay. in, in Shropshire, and I'm just wondering. Also, the lack of land um, could be addressed by growing crops hydroponically. Yes, aeroponics, hydroponics, they're all really interesting um, uh, technologies, I think. I mean, you can, you can almost have a, a garden in your house, mm -hmm. uh, in that sense, or, or in a garage or a shed, you know, those kind of things. And um, because you don't need soil to grow plants, you just need, you just need nutrients um, to be sprayed on them. Uh, you know, soil really is the anchor, so they don't move. You know? yeah, just, just an aside there on, on soil and um, the veganic farming method. We have an inquiry in with um, a veganic farmer um, in Tinnahili in Ireland, and uh, they haven't res responded yet, but we're hoping they'll come on and do a webinar or something like tonight and give us the lowdown on what it is about veganic farming and veganic organic market gardening, everything from a big commercial uh, operation to somebody just doing something on their patio. So we're waiting for a response from them. Uh, so we so we will know about it and we know about soil and we get it from them. So that, that sounds good, especially they might be able to clarify because it it changes from, from country to country, but um, all, organic is often not vegan friendly in the sense you talk about, you know, uh, fish blood or fish meal, um, you know, blood and bone meal being used. And mm -hmm. so um, depending on, on the country, you've got a problem with organic and yet you know, it tends to obviously be pesticide free and all that, which again is a major kind of problem in, in the sense that, you know, we're killing so many other animals to produce crops. So it's, that's a vegan issue really. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Bernie, are you off mute yet? Uh, <laughs> Hello. I'm, I'm hey, going to see some of the screen. That's kind of been funny. Um, no, it was just a remark I was making there to Tara. You mentioned the vet, Patrick. He approves yeah. of greyhound racing. So I don't think he's on our side. I hear you. Tackled him about it. He didn't deny it. Oh dear. I think we need to get the adults before we get the kids because in the, in the situation with the schools, when we tried to get into the schools, we were okay where the schools knew us. They knew we were okay, you know. 
but the ones that didn't know us didn't really want us. That's the problem we had if we wanted to get around schools. Like Roger, with all the material and everything, we did a few, we did some uh, scout places, didn't we? Hmm. And, and they went quite well. And we have, we have you back and all the rest, but... Yeah, um, we, did, we did a few ones to very young children, you know, um, fives and sixes, and of course then you've got to be very careful about what you say. And, you know, in, in terms of uh, things like graphic materials or graphic details of, of, of animal use, uh, you, you know, you, you, can't, you can't be showing them earth things, put it that way, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Of course. Um, what, what was the Bramble Committee, Roger, do you mind? It was a government committee in uh, 65, I think it was, in England, and they were basically reacting to um, Ruth Harrison's book. And um, it was one of the first inquiries into um, what they call animal welfare. But I think they looked at, you know, you know, who animals were really in terms of are they sentient? Or do they feel and that kind of stuff? They 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 did make um, a comment. I think I've got it as a meme somewhere on the VIP page. They did make a comment about the um, the anguish of separating calves from cows. And, and again, it's really quite interesting uh, in the sense that, um, again, we, we tend to think, oh, the, these are things that um, are claims that modern day vegans make, but it goes back um, mm. forever. In fact, let me just get this up and I'll, I'll read it to you. It's, it's incredible. This is from the Vegan News, number three, 1945. And it says, a telepathic communication from a cow you kidnap my children, steal my milk, kill me and eat me, and then strut about in my hide. So that's, a, again, wow. a very kind of modern sounding kind of uh, yeah. accusation, as, as it were. But they, um, they, talk, they talked about that quite a lot on the grounds that uh, the vegans were trying initially to, to have a non-dairy section of the vegetarian society. So they were all kind of non-dairy vegetarians. That's how, that's how they describe themselves. And the vegetarians told them that they didn't want to have such a section. And, and I always say they did the vegans a great favor because they basically said, look, don't, don't come in with us, strike out on your own. And that's what the vegans did. And then, and then 10 years later, we had vegan philosophy, which was much more radical, a, a revolutionary idea compared with vegetarianism, for example. And so by that kind of, if you like, polite, refusal from the vegetarians it did did veganism a lot of favors i think mm. Mm. onwards and upwards <laughs> the momentum they've been at it for quite a while you know christ well i like i like the optimism in this group i mean dennis, dennis is uh, mr Optimi optimist isn't he <laughs> <laughs> glass, glass half full. <laughs> yes, of course. Yes, why not? Well, I think we have to be to be at this so long, you know. Yeah, glass is getting very optimistic. Yeah, it's, it's the people we're meeting. It's the good people we're meeting. The the subject matter obviously is terrible. We know that. But what I find and what gives me great great energy and strength and the synergy is the good people I bump I bump into every day and every other day and every week. And a lot of you are around here tonight. So thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, well, on that, and I think Bernie would probably disagree with me on this, as she often does. Oh, um, I'm afraid to hear this. <laughs> one, one thing that has changed in the movement is that we, we, we stopped, or at least a lot of us stopped looking for enemies to fight. And we start to look for people to educate. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I always say, in fact, Bernie, you'll remember me saying this years ago to you. Do you think there are any ethical vegans out there that we don't know? And you said yes. And I said, well, in that case, we need to find them. Because that is the thing that ultimately will, will create the fundamental change. Of course, if it, prove, if it proves that we exhaust that seam, if you like, and there's not enough of them, then we've got a problem. But hopefully there will be enough, going back to what Dennis was saying about the figures and everything, if we can get to the 10%, then we can then start to change the culture because we do have that momentum. And so 
I always think the best thing to do is if we assume there's ethical vegans out there, let's go find them. Hmm. Yeah, and then they'll, they'll be more created as well. It's not like it's a static kind of thing. I mean, I think that yeah. more and more people are, are coming around. Um, so yeah, no, it's- Really it's, everywhere you go, you find people that just pop up and yeah. say, oh, I'm vegan. Who said vegan, you know? <laughs> oh, what more can you ask for? But what do we do with them? How do we get them together? We need them to be activists too. Well, it, it, that actually is really interesting, Bernie, because there was, um, if people look at Vegans of Ireland, and I don't know whether you people are m members of that, some, somebody, somebody was saying, uh, is it just me? But whenever I post anything about veganism, I don't get any likes, and sometimes I get told off and everything. And there was a big mm -hmm. thread that followed. And these modern-day vegans were very kind of timid they were frightened to talk about veganism because in, ca in case their friends uh, unfriended them or mm. their family had a bit of a go at them and everything. And um, I was talking to somebody today and they said, well, these people, they don't seem to be the kind of people who would become activists, but they are right. vegan. And so there is this um, ideological conflict really about do we create activists who become vegan or do we create vegans who we hope will become activists? And so if you think about it, you might have some activists who don't become vegan. There's one thing. But then you've got some vegans who become uh, who don't become activists, but at least they're vegan. And that's yeah. doing in, in, in its own right. But the yeah. ideal situation is to try and convince them to take up some form of activism, even if it's just door dropping or leafleting right into your paper whatever whatever th those kind of things because an, an active vegan i mean uh, ronnie ronnie lee talks about this he said um, first go vegan then get active and then become an organizer because we need more organizers as much as anything else well they're also models of behavior uh, in, in you know their own behavior every day which is yeah you know, activism as well yeah. Lead, yeah. lead by example. Yeah, exactly. 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 Right, right, right. No, that makes sense. Well, I think one, one of the things we should look at, and I when I first heard the idea, I didn't think it was great. It's just if set up a circle of people um and go for go for a meal together, you know, if that could be the activity and the talk around it. I think. Marie, you were talking about that last year. If you're yep. still here, are you, Marie? I am. I'm here. Yeah, I, I think that's something we should explore in, in the local sense, the Connacht sense. You know, going to Westport, maybe put an ad down there. We're meeting up. Any other vegans in the area, would you like to call up and see us? Exactly. You know, once or two and book the restaurant. I mean, we've all that. got to go to the States to, uh, to have a meal with Louise. Is, is, that, is that what you're saying? Yes, let's do that too. <laughs> okay, we're packed. <laughs> right. And, and let's have Louise come over and then we can um, have meals there too. When, um, when are you coming over, Louise? Well, exactly. I'm, working I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I have to do like a couple different things all at the same time. So I'm trying to get okay. them coincided. But no, it's definitely in the works. It'll definitely be not long. Um, no, got to do it. I thought it was uh, April. I thought you said April. Well, it was. It was. But that was then I was going to come over with those, uh, the Veterans for Peace from over here were having their trial because of what happened in Shannon Airport a long time ago. Anyway, that, that isn't happening. So I got to like, yeah. anyway, I got to put it all together. But if uh, it'll I happen. Gonna, I hope you're going to row over so you don't have to go on an airplane. As long as you drive, Louise. Sure. <laughs> That'd be great. Wow. There's a story behind that, but I won't go there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, think, I think we need to um, work on the word veganism. It's it seems to be a bad word in, in many in many uh, places these days. You know, I see a lot of uh, a lot of threads where people vegans are talking to other vegans and derogatory terms and you know there's there's something has to change in that respect i believe um you know you get these kind of high and mighty vegans that 
are are forgetting the the kind of compassionate um, terms that surround the word, yeah. you know. Um, so I don't know. I tend to leave ve the word vegan out of most things these days. <laughs> Vegans just being vegans with yeah. the, the subjects, just being themselves, but not go lecturing about it. Mm. Just mm. talk about mm. it, you know. Yeah, it's um, I suppose um, getting getting the word out there, what what veganism encompasses, um you know, I think would be interesting, especially with the way um, Roger has mentioned so many different, you know, um, dates and, and uh, you know, from, from 1635, 1638, 1944, 1976, you know, the, 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 the ages of, of um, veganism, you know, it's, it, it would be nice to... Um, I think Dennis and, and Carol would be nice and Marie and everybody, Ted, to put up, um, you know, something on veganism regarding the, the particular dates and stuff and and uh, let people see what vegans have thought about in 1944 or 1975 and, and stuff. And, and I think that people think that veganism is something that's just been kind of created in the past 20 years, mm. you know? Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited to um, look into, uh, you know, doing, doing posts regarding the, the references you made there, Roger, that's, that's great. Okay. And any, if, if anybody wants a copy of the PowerPoint, I'm quite happy to send it to them. Me, me. Yeah, yeah. Are we putting it around? Yeah, right, I kind of have to go, guys, because I'm losing light and I've got some dogs to bring in. I was to go over okay, Carol, good to see you. You're looking great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> It was great being here, and um, thanks very much, Roger. That was that was very interesting. Um, close to thank you. Well, How'd you have it, Tara? I, I'm surprised that I made any sense today, to be honest, uh, after my experience. But there you go. I know. Well done. Well done. I won't say anything, Roger. I'll call you, Bernie. Definitely. Okay. She's gone. <laughs> I'll call you, Bernie, as well. Okay, right. come up in the other corner. Don't call me Bernie. Okay. <laughs> Let's call everybody Bernie. Uh, <laughs> all right. I'll, I'll talk to you later, Louise. I have to go up and try and find some foxes now. That's where I've, I forgot about tonight. Yeah, okay. I have to go. I'll tell you all later, okay? All right, all right, for sure. Roger yeah. knows where should I'm I going. Stop the should I stop the recording now that we're making yes. social plans? Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. We let 